Now, <clears throat> today, I'm, I'm a backup today, I'm fill-in, because we were supposed to have a missionary today and a missionary next week. Both of them had to cancel, but for very different reasons. Uh, today, I believe today, was our, our day to have, uh, uh, of course, Tammy can probably correct me, I don't know which is which, I may get them backwards, but uh, today, I believe, was the day we were supposed to have Lou and Lek May. Okay, all right. Uh, missionaries to, uh, I believe they're going to Laos. Um, now, two years ago, I met uh, Lou, L-U, um, May, in Tank, Thailand when I was there. And he and I had breakfast together. And I ran into him this past fall in Canton at a preacher's meeting. And um, after we started talking for a few minutes, I recognized him. I said, wait a minute, I had, didn't I have breakfast with you in Bangkok two years ago? He said, yeah, that's right, we did. And uh, since then, he's gotten married. Um, to a girl, I don't remember whether I met her there or not, but he, he, he and she are from Laos, but they were in Bangkok for training with the Salmons there at Bangjak Baptist Church, which is kind of a hub for Southeast, Southeastern Asia uh, missionaries. And so they were there for training and preparing to go back to Laos. And so they were going to be with us today, but uh, very recently his wife, his brand new wife, was diagnosed with a very, very serious medical issue and is about to have major surgery for that, so they were not able to be here today. Next week, our missionary was supposed to be Ephraim Goldstein, and uh, he is a missionary to the Jewish people in Israel, and he's over there now. And he was planning to be here last uh, March with us, but we had to cancel because of the COVID. This year, he was going to come again, rescheduled, had to cancel a few weeks ago because the restrictions in Israel uh, got tighter. And so he had to cancel his trip, not allowed to leave the country right now. So we don't have any missions, missionaries for Missions Month. <clears throat> so we're going to reschedule our Missions Month. But I, I think I need to speak for them, sort of for them today on what they would have covered. And so the idea today is what you see in your handout, God's plan for world evangelism. God's plan for world evangelism. This is what we are to do as a church. This is what we are to do as believers. We are missionaries here in Columbus to the people in Columbus, just as those folks are to the people where they are uh, designated to go. So that's what our topic is going to be. Uh, before we um, start on in that, that message, though, let's read the text. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, going down to verse 8. It says this, "'The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Now, this is the introduction. What's happening here, this is essentially a letter from Luke to his friend Theophilus. He has already started writing about the, the events that took place in the life of Jesus and the beginning of the Christian church. That's what we find in the Gospel of Luke. Luke wrote Luke. That's probably the most profound thing you'll hear me say today, right? Luke wrote Luke. Now, but that was part one. Acts is part two. It's like the sequel to the book of Luke. So he continues writing, not just about the acts of Jesus Christ in his ministry, but now the acts of the apostles. So he says, the former treatise, that's the book of Luke, have I written, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began, note that, began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. We'll see more about that in Luke chapter 2. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So they believed that the Lord was going to set up his millennial kingdom then, just as many of us are looking for that now. They said, Lord, are you going to get, this out, get us out of this mess and start us over and take over and rule and reign for a thousand years? And he said, verse 7, it is not for you to know. That's still true today. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. He says, this is more important to do right now. Verse 8. 
But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Let's go on to verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word, what it has for us. Father, help us to take it to heart. Help us to take it in and live it out every day, everywhere, until you return in your own good time. May your will be done, I pray, in this message, in our time together. In Jesus' name I ask it all. Amen. <clears throat> the first point I want to get across, and, and you've only got three blanks here, right? Uh, your first one is this. The Word of God commands it. God's plan for world evangelism. The Word of God commands it. Now, it's not just because it's written here on the page in black ink on white paper. That's not what I mean by the Word of God, although that is the Word of God. What you hold in your hands, what you're seeing on the screen, is the Word of God, the written Word of God. But I'm also talking about the verbal words of the Lord Jesus Christ, the last thing he said to his disciples before he ascended up into heaven. He told them, ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, that's local, that's their hometown, and in Judea, the area surrounding Jerusalem. We're all we're primarily Jewish people. Then in Samaria, those were the people who were not all like them. These Samaritans were half Jewish, half Gentile. He said, I want you to go to them too. Then he said to the uttermost parts of the earth. He says, the Gentile nations, I want you, remember, they're all Orthodox Jews he's talking to. He says, I want you to evangelize those who are like you, those who are a little bit like you, those who are not like you at all. I want you to go everywhere preaching the word of God, giving them the gospel. He gives this in another place, actually four other places, all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all contain similar commands, what we call the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, Go ye therefore, because all power is given unto me in heaven and earth, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. These are the last things Jesus said before he went to heaven. These commands are his last will and testament. Now, if you have someone that you love who has written a will, if you love them, you want to carry out their wishes as best you can, right? That's the last best thing you can do for your loved one is to carry out their last wishes. These are Jesus' last wishes. All of us should have wills. If you haven't had one yet, you need to make one out. If you haven't done it for a long time, you probably need to update it. But a will specifies what is important to you. What you want to have done with those things are very pre that are precious to you and causes that you want to take care of. John Jacob Astor, for example, wrote a will, one of the richest men in the world in his day, if not the richest, I don't remember who was not in his day, but he wrote a will in which he left a whole lot of money to build a system of libraries in New York. Andrew Carnegie did the same thing, for example. Um, a, number of, a number of people uh, wrote wills that were very important. Yul Brynner, I've forgotten about this one. Yul Brynner, remember the actor in The King and I? He shaved his head for The King and I and left it uh, that way the rest of his life. Um, he got cancer, uh, lung cancer, from smoking, chain smoking most of his life. And his last will was to give a lot of money to the American Cancer Society because that was a cause that was near and dear to his heart. Joseph Pulitzer, who was a publisher, who left his money uh, to provide awards for excellence in various kinds of writing. Journalism, could be uh, fiction writing, could be nonfiction writing, reporting, various kinds of things, all the different kinds of literature. Uh, that was important to him. Alfred Nobel, who invented dynamite, uh, was regretful, you almost say, almost say appalled at the way his invention was used in destructive ways 
to kill each other, you know, in, in bombs and wars and things of that sort. He, he intended it for peaceful purposes so that you could dynamite things and, and like for mining and road building, you know, to blow up rocks so that you could uh, clear, clear roads through mountains and things of that sort. But he didn't anticipate the destructive use that his invention would be put to. So he left his money for the Nobel Prizes, primarily the Peace Prize. He wanted to reward efforts for peace rather than war. James Smithson uh, was a man in England who left his money because he wanted to establish a national museum. Well, oddly enough, England didn't want his money. They didn't want to use it for the purposes he intended. They did not want to build a national museum And so instead, that money came to the United States, and we built a national museum today called the Smithsonian Institution. Thank you, England, for saying no, okay? But what I'm saying is the last will and testament that a person has is going to um, tell you what is nearest and dearest to their heart. Jesus' last will and testament was for his disciples those who were living, those who would come after them, which includes you and me, for us to evangelize the world around us, beginning at home and then spreading outward. And this is what we see in the New Testament church, the book of Acts especially. We see that the disciples were all gathered there at Jerusalem and stayed there as Jesus commanded. He said, I want you to stay here until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that would happen in the next chapter. Now the reason, on the day of Pentecost, remember when the the Holy Spirit came down and indwelt the believers for the first time. There were tongues like flame on their heads and a rushing mighty wind in the room, and they all speak with other tongues to evangelize the people who were in the room from all over the known world in the Roman Empire at that time, all speaking different languages. And that's what the gift of tongues was, by the way. Those disciples spoke in the languages of those people around them, having never learned them. That was what was miraculous about it. But Jesus' point was, you can't do what I want you to do until you have the Holy Spirit living in you and empowering you and teaching you and guiding you. You can't do it on your own. Now, you and I, at the moment we got saved, at the moment you got saved, you got the Holy Spirit just as those disciples did on the day of Pentecost. And you and I have the same power they did, the same power the apostles did, We have all the fullness of God in us, according to the book of Ephesians. We are enabled and equipped to do what God has told us to do. So that's what the Word of God commands, is for us to evangelize the world. But they hesitated. Look at verse 10. They looked steadfastly toward heaven. They were watching him as he went up. Well, I can't blame them for that. How often do you see somebody standing on solid ground, and then all of a sudden just floating right up? Wouldn't that freak you out? Well, yeah, I'd be standing there too. And while they're looking up, they didn't realize there's two guys standing over here. They're angelic beings who appeared as young men. And all of a sudden, they broke the silence and the awe by saying, Hey, you guys, what are you doing looking up there? This same Jesus, who's risen up in heaven, so shall, so shall come in like manner as you've seen him go. In other words... According to the book of Zechariah, when the Lord comes back, he's going to descend from heaven out of the clouds. This is the second coming of Christ, not the rapture, the second coming of Christ. He's going to descend out of the same clouds and come down just as slowly as he went up. And when his feet touched the Mount of Olives, the mountain's going to split in two, and he's going to cross down the, into the Kidron Valley and come up on the other side into Jerusalem, go into the Eastern Gate and sit on the throne of David where he's going to rule and reign with a thousand years with you and I ruling and reigning with him. That'll be a great day, won't it? Amen. So he's saying, but as much as we are excited about that, we have work to do until then. We have to do what he said to do. He said, occupy till I come, didn't he? This is what we are to do. They were clinging to the past. They were clinging to the present. They were not looking to the future. But the Holy Spirit said, listen, you guys go back to Jerusalem, wait until you get the power of the Holy Spirit, and then you've got work to do. Look to the future. Get ready for what the job is. It's not done yet. And that's the same with all of us. We can't just sit around and 
and live in the past or, and, and wonder why things aren't as nice as they used to be? Why, do, why can't things be like they were in the good old days? And, or we can't live in the present and say, man, we live in an awful world. Lord, please come back. When are you coming back? No, we, we need to stay busy until he gets here, right? Because there's still people that have to get saved. And the Lord's not coming back till that last person gets saved. So the busier we are, the more we get on it and witness to people and lead people to Christ, you, you might be the one who leads that last person to Christ and brings the Lord back, right? That could be today, right? So we need to find out who that person is and, and win them to Christ. Clay, is it you? No, no. <laughs> oh, Clay's saved. But we don't know who that person is. And that's my point. We don't know who that person is. So we need to go out and witness to people. As the Lord gives us opportunity. And we need to try and win everybody to Christ as much as we can. Point number two. The wreck of sin demands it. The wreck of sin demands it. The Word of God commands it. The wreck of sin demands it. <clears throat> God's plan will not be thwarted because of our sin. You know that? When we rebel against God or when we get faithless, uh, when we get tired and stop doing what we need to do, that's not going to stop God. God's going to do things in spite of us, right? We see that, well, we've seen that in the last couple of weeks. We've been talking about God using people and setting people up for his purposes, uh, such as Nebuchadnezzar, such as Pharaoh, such as, I think I talked about Darius and Cyrus this past week in Young Hearts, and on Wednesday night, God set them up to accomplish his will. And these are unsaved people. God is able to use anybody for his purposes. So if he can use unsaved people to accomplish his will, he can use believers who sin against him, who are unfaithful. In fact, I've often asked God, especially back when I was a brand new Christian, and it's kind of a, a dumb request. I said, Lord, why didn't you let the angels evangelize the world? I mean, they, 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 two-thirds of the angels have never rebelled against God. They've been faithful to you. They will never let you down. They, they know exactly how to glorify you. They, they will evangelize the world a whole lot better than I can. Why don't you have them do it instead of me? Then the Lord showed me that scripture verse and told me that the angels don't know what it means to be saved. They'd like to know more about salvation themselves. These are things that the angels would like to look into. Only you and I you know what it's like to have been on the other side, opposed to God, not interested in God, not believing in God, not trusting in God. And then coming to the point where we heard the gospel and the Holy Spirit hit us in the heart and convicted us of our sin and our sinfulness and gave us the faith to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. And now that we've given our lives to Jesus, now that he's, the Holy Spirit's living in us, and we are transformed from the inside out. We have been on both sides of that. The angels don't know what that's like. They don't have a testimony to share with others. You and I do. Remember when you first got saved? Remember what a transformation was in your life? Remember what the relationship was like with your friends before you got saved? Remember what the relationship with your life, with your friends, were after you got saved? It's a whole lot different thing, isn't it? They saw a difference in you. You had a great testimony. You could, that's when you're, the, the time is ripest for you to witness to your family and your friends because they see the change in you. When you've been saved 20, 30, 40 years, it's a little harder then because nobody's around to remember what you used to be like. But you need to witness to the other, those others around you. They need to know your testimony. You need to share that with them. They need to know what it's like to have been on both sides. Isaiah 53, verses 3 and 6. The Lord uh, took our rebellion on himself. This passage called the suffering servant, Isaiah chapter 53. <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not Jewish. I'm certainly not Orthodox Jewish, but the the scriptures are read in the Jewish synagogues every week. And it's my understanding, if, if somebody knows differently, let me know, but it's my understanding that this chapter is not read in the synagogues. And this is part of the reason why. Because it points to Jesus Christ, clearly. 
He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Aren't you glad for that? But God loves us in spite of our sinfulness. Now, we were all sinners before we got saved, right? Ready for a shock? You're still sinners, right? We still are. We, we, we are just, we've changed our destination. We're forgiven. We're saved, but we're still sinners. That's the only difference between us and those who don't know the Lord, right? So we have no reason to be self-righteous about our sin. We used to have a sign over the door in the other building years ago. It said, only sinners welcome here. Because that's what a church is. A church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a museum for saints. Right? We're all in need of more fellowship, encouraging uh, admonishment, uh, rebuke sometimes. We all need that because we're all sinners trying to figure out the best way to serve our Lord in, our, in, the, in the sinful and unfaithful condition we find ourselves in. We're no better than the Apostle Paul who wrote Romans chapter 7 and said, oh, oh, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I, I don't want to do, I do. He says, I, I, I've got this, this terrible condition, the sin living in my body, and it's fighting. The flesh is fighting with the spirit. All of us are that way. The Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian who ever lived, the greatest missionary who ever walked the earth, had that conflict all the time. Yet look what God used in him and God accomplished through him, right? So God loves us in spite of our sinfulness. Romans 5, 6, and, uh, 7, and 8 so first, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth or demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for good people. Because there aren't any. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it's like I, like I like to point out, those two verses from Romans chapter 3 were written to a church full of Christians. It was not written to a bunch of sinners hanging out in a bar somewhere. It was written to a church. <coughs> Number three, the work of the church expands it. The word of God commands it. The wreck of sin demands it. The work of the church expands it. You know, this church and other Bible-believing churches like ours, whether they're Baptist or not, doesn't matter. But a New Testament church, which teaches the Bible, teaches the gospel, and teaches evangelism and missions, all of our churches are centers for world evangelism. We are essentially the home office and we are the ones who not only evangelize our community here, but our job is to evangelize the entire world. We're not to shuffle that responsibility off into somebody else and say, well, well that mission agency will take care of it. Oh, that, that church over there, they're a lot bigger than us. They've got a lot more money and resources. They'll, they'll take care of it. No, that's our job. When the Lord says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he wasn't just talking to those apostles there. We need to take that personally. All of us are to do that. Every one of us is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, how are you going to do that? There's probably 7.3, 7.5. I'm not sure what the number is. It's changing all the time. As soon as I give you a number, it's going to change because somebody just had a baby somewhere. 
but there's about seven and a half billion people on the planet. How are you going to reach all those people? Well, you can't. You can reach one at a time. So what do you do to fulfill that command? Well, you band together with other believers here at Crossroads Baptist Church, and we team together, and you say, well, okay, I'll take care of this person because I know them, and you take care of that person because you know them, and you take care of that person you know them, and we'll reach more that way. Oh, what about the rest outside of our church? Well, I guess what we need to do is get somebody else to go over there and take care of them and preach the gospel to those folks, maybe up in eastern Ohio or, or eastern Ohio or northern Ohio or over in Washington state uh, or out in Alaska or down in Florida. How are we going to do that? Well, we need to get somebody else and, and we need to help them to go. Well, how are they going to go? Well, we can help them get there. We can, we can help pay their expenses, buy them some gas and help them with their rent and their utilities and their food, and, and we can help them get down there. So you chip in a little bit, I'll chip in a little bit. Well, what about people outside the United States? What about folks in Canada who need to hear the gospel? What about folks in South America who need to hear the gospel? What about folks in Asia who need to hear the gospel? Well, yeah, you're right, let's send somebody over there too. Well, how are they going to go? Well, let's all chip in and take care of them too. Folks, that's what missions is, and it all starts right here. And if our church does that, and then that church over there does that, and that church over there does that, and that church over there does that, together we all chip in and do our best to send missionaries all around the world. That's why we're here. It's not a club just for us. Our job is to reach others, and when we stop doing that, our church is dead. We become inward-focused, and a lot of churches have died this way. They lose their vision to reach the world, and they start moving inward and saying, okay, let's just take care of some needs here. And and, in in the most evangelized country in the world, although still a lot of people need to be evangelized in the United States, make a mistake, but we still are one of the most evangelized countries in the world, then we lose the focus of getting the gospel out, we start focusing on social justice. We start taking care of felt needs, physical needs. Are those important? Yes, absolutely. Do we need to take care of people's food and their gas and their shelter and things like that? Absolutely we do. Are those important? Yes, they are. What is the most important thing? The gospel, evangelism. That is the priority. One of the devil's best tools to divert us from following God's will is to get us onto good things so that we miss the best things. We need to focus on those while not avoiding the other ones. <clears throat> the Lord said to the Pharisees, for example, he says, you guys pay tithe of men and anise and cumin, and you do all those things that you're supposed to do, but you ignore the weightier matters of the law. He says, you ought to do these two and not ignore those. He says, you ought to do all of them. He didn't say, do these things over here and forget giving tithe of men and ants and cumin. He says, no, continue doing what you're doing. But you need to do the things that, that are more important. Do them all. We need to do that too. That is our job. That is our focus. That's why we evangelize. And you can see, see this hallway over here uh, where all our missionaries are posted on the wall. Uh, 26, 27 of them, I believe, that we support. And you can go down the hall and see who they are and where they are and what they're doing. But we also take care of the physical needs as best we can. We've got the food pantry. We help other people out as best we can uh, when we can. Our folks come first. If you're a member of Crossroads Baptist Church, we take care of you first. And then we, as we can beyond that, then we take care of folks who are not members of our church. But our folks come, come first, as the Lord said. Uh, But this is our job to evangelize the world, and we band together to do that. This is what the Apostle Paul did, and we try to do missions the way he did it. Remember, he was sent out from the church at Antioch in Syria. There were two Antiochs, at least two Antiochs. There's one in south-central Turkey. Uh, There's one up in in, uh, Syria, north of Jerusalem. That's the church he was sent out of. It was a Gentile church, and he was an Orthodox Jewish person. 
But they sent him out. They would give him money and support him. He would go out uh, and make these journeys with an entourage. And his team would go out and they would evangelize people. They would establish churches. They would baptize people. They would disciple them. And then eventually he would come back to Antioch. He would report to that church. Then he would go out again. This is the way we do it today. Now, this is why our missionaries come back every four years or so. Some of them come back at two years, some at different times, whenever they can. And they come back, and they make the rounds here at the churches that support them, like ours, and they, they report to us. And that's why when they come, any missionary we support, I say, you have an open door to come back anytime you want. It's not going to be just in March or November or whenever we have a mission conference. Whenever you can come back, you have an open invitation to come back to Crossroads and report on your ministry. Because that is biblical. That's the way they did it in the book of Acts, right? This is what we are to do. We are to evangelize the world as best we can. This is the focus of our whole existence as a church. Paul confronted his culture and used it as a tool for evangelism. You know that? Uh, When Paul went to Athens, uh, there was some persecution uh, where he was, and so he went to Athens to kind of wait it out and wait for his other uh, cohorts (laughs) to come and and meet up with him again. In Acts chapter 17, we see what he did while he was there just waiting. He didn't just sit in his hotel room and and watch ESPN. You know, he was busy. It says, And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. It's like Gossip City. Gossip City. I learned a new term this week, by the way. Some of you probably already know it. It's called spilling the tea. Ever heard that? Okay. That's sharing gossip. Okay. If you share gossip with somebody, you're spilling the tea. Okay. I spent more time this week brewing tea, uh, trying to come up with gossip that we could spill. But anyway, so they, they were to either tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, and what, what he means by that is uh, in Areopagus, this is an open, uh, like, a, like an open area, I wouldn't call it like a market, but it wasn't where they just came and sold, sold things, but where they came and met and talked, philosophy and religion and politics and everything else they talked about. They had um, monuments to different gods and goddesses that, they, that, the Gre- that the Greeks worshipped. And then they had one that he mentions here. He says, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown god. In other words, all the Greeks worshipped these various gods and goddesses, the same ones like the Romans had, you know, Zeus and Jupiter, the type of thing. It's the same god with different names. Romans called them uh, Jupiter, and I think the Greeks called them Zeus. They had all these different other gods and goddesses. And just in case they forgot one, and they don't want to offend some god, small g god, they had one that says, to the unknown god. Paul seized that opportunity. He saw that. You know, they're worshiping all these different gods and goddesses. And instead of standing up and condemning all of them and putting up a wall, a barrier between him and them so that they wouldn't listen to him at that point, instead he says, listen, I was looking at your devotions around here. I was looking at these different monuments and I saw one that says, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Paul saw that devotion to a false god and used it as a tool for evangelism. That's what we're to do too. Use any opportunity. Somebody talks about sports, we can turn that to faith. If somebody talks about politics, we can turn that to faith. Somebody talks about their job, we can turn that to a faith-based conversation. Uh, we had uh, a dentist in here a few years ago, Duke Heller. I don't know if you remember him. Uh, he's a well-known dentist up in Worthington. I think he might be retired now. But his whole ministry is how to start a kingdom conversation, how to take any conversation and turn it spiritually so you can get the gospel in there. That's what the Apostle Paul did in this instance and numerous others as well. But we are to confront our culture. Now, others do it in a different way by ignoring culture, by not liking your culture, and by canceling your culture. That's the big thing today. You and I are not called to 
just cancel it out and say, well, I don't like your culture. I don't like your custom. I want you to stop talking about it. I want you to stop practicing it because it offends me. Paul could have done that. He could have gone to Areopagus and said, listen, you guys worship all these false gods. I'm offended. I think we need to tear all these monuments down and get rid of them and never talk about them again. He did not do that. Instead, he used it as a springboard for a gospel conversation. By the way, that uh, gauge in the back is still there. I, don't, I haven't talked about it for a long time, but we've got the evangelism gauge in the back. And, and some, sometimes people ask me, what is this thing, this box full of golf balls? It's got green and silver and gold golf balls in it. Well, the idea of that is that if you go through the week and you have a conversation with somebody that is spiritual in nature, you take a green golf ball out of the box, out of the drawer in the bottom, take a green golf ball out, and you drop it in that box there. If you have a conversation with somebody during the week that is not only spiritual in nature, but included the gospel, you told them how to get saved, you take out a silver ball, put that in the box. And then third, if you have a conversation with somebody during the week that, where you had not only a spiritual conversation that included the gospel message, but you also got to win them to the Lord, take out a gold ball, put it in that box. And as we see that box fill up, and you can see it, it's a half full there, um, and I hope there's still golf balls in the, bo in the bo uh, drawer, I don't know, I, we may need to refill it, but you can see the conversations that our folks are having with people. Spiritual conversations, gospel conversations, people they want to Christ. That is what the Apostle Paul does. This, that is the fulfillment of what we're talking about here. So what we want our missionaries to do is not only evangelize, but we want them to plant churches as the Apostle Paul did. And so the missionaries that we look at taking on, very, 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 very seldom will we consider taking on a missionary who is not a church planter. About the only one I can think of who isn't is Bob and Joy Burney. We support them. Uh, they, are, they are evangelists to Christians. You know, they have cross-power ministry, sharing the message of the cross to Christians, empowering them. And that's really the, the only exception I know of. All of our other missionaries are church planters. They go out and they establish churches, and they win people to Christ, disciple them, and eventually the, the goal is to have someone in their church that they have won to Christ and discipled take over that church, and then they go out and start another one. That is what most of our missionaries do. This is what happened in the book of Acts. I won't take the time to go into the details. Uh, I'm going to save a little time with that, but the verses are on your handout. You can look those up. But our philosophy of missions here at Crossroads Baptist Church is to plant churches. And then everything else emanates from that local church. Because God worked through the local church. That's what the book of Acts tells about. We don't see parachurch ministries. We don't see televangelists. All the money that came in for missions and ministry went through a local church and then went out from there. And that's what happens with missions here at Crossroads Baptist Church. Every penny that comes in for missions, every, every penny we give to missions, goes to that missionary. Uh, for example, like the Baptist Bible Fellowship missionaries, that's based in Springfield, Missouri. We've got a World Baptist Fellowship uh, based in Fort Worth, Texas. We've got other ones as well. Every penny we send to that missionary, we, we support our missionaries now currently the, in the budget you just approved uh, last month. We now support our missionaries at $75 a month each. When we send a check for $75 for that missionary through their missions agency, and like with Baptist Bible Fellowship, we've got maybe a dozen missionaries through them, so we, we bundle them all together. We send a big check, and it covers all those missionaries. What the missions office does, is they, they take that check, and we tell them who to send it to, and they distribute $75 to every missions account of the missionaries that we support. They don't keep anything for themselves. All of it goes to that missionary. That's the way I like it. That's the way I like it. Every penny we send them goes to that missionary. But that's what it's for. And we don't, we don't believe in sending money to a non-local church ministry. Because Jesus did not die for a non-local church ministry. Jesus died for his church, Ephesians tells us. His church is so precious to him. It's the bride of Christ. As Adam was into a deep sleep for his wife so that she could come forth, Jesus died so that his bride could come forth. He died for his bride. 
That's why I don't send money to televangelists. And even good radio Bible programs on, on the radio. Uh, I mean, if you've got extra money and you, you, you've got money you don't know what to do with, that's different. But, but the focus and the bulk of your giving, your, your tithe and your offerings, need to go through your local church so that it's, it's funneled in those directions I'm talking about. That's what it's for. And I'm very, very happy that this year, for the first time in our church's history, as far as I know, and I only go back 50 years, but, but as far as I know in our church's history, we have never given uh, uh, more than 10% of our giving to missions. This year we are. For the first time, we're given more than 10%. That is, we are, as a church, we are actually tithing to missions. Yeah. That's a milestone. We've been talking about doing that 15 years. We've been, that's been our goal. And this year, uh, we finally achieved it. But the purpose of missions is for evangelism, it's for church planning, it's for discipleship. <clears throat> we see that with Apollos in Acts chapter 18. We see it with Barnabas discipling Paul. This is what it's all about. And then giving. We see giving in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, moreover, brethren, the Lord, uh, Paul tells his, his, uh, uh, the people at Corinth, this church at Corinth had a lot of issues, a lot of things that Paul was correcting them about. One of them he needed to talk about was giving. He says, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He's using the churches in northern Greece, or just above Greece in Macedonia, as an example of what it means to give. He says, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. What he's saying there is that these churches in Macedonia, even though they were in deep poverty, gave sacrificially for the purpose of missions because they wanted to see the gospel go to others who had not heard it yet. They had heard it. And even though they were physically poor, they were spiritually rich and they wanted to share the blessings of Christ with those who had not yet heard. So the questions I have for you are, what are you going to do for the cause of missions in 2021? What are you going to do? Will you first ask God to lay a burden on your heart for world evangelism? Well, evangelism locally, in the mid-range, and also out in the outer parts of the earth. All of it. Will you ask God how much he wants to give, how much he wants to give through you this next year? And lastly, but certainly not least, in fact, this is probably the most important question. Will you ask God if he wants you to go? Ask God if he wants you to go. He may well say, no, I think you're okay where you are. This is what he's done for me several times, several times. I remember back in 1995 and 96, I was asking that question. I remember back in well, 15 years ago or so, I was asking that question. I remember again about eight or nine years ago, I was asking that question. And again, just a few years ago, I was asking that question. I, ask him, I try to stay open to that all the time. Lord, do you want me to stay here at Crossroads? Do you want me to stay here in Columbus? Or do you want us to go somewhere else around the world and, and be missionaries somewhere? Gene and I actually wanted to be missionaries at a couple of different points. We said, we want, we want to go here. These people really need to hear the gospel. We did that in Mexico City. We saw the need there, the spiritual need. Those people were in deep poverty too, but they needed to hear the gospel and they were open to it. They were excited to hear it. We handed out thousands of tracts and not one ended up on the ground. Everybody who got it read it and were glad to read it. We thought, wow, what a, what a fertile field to be in. We'd like to come down here. God said, no, you're right where we want you. And so here, here we are. But have you ever asked God, do you want me to stay here or do you want me to go somewhere else? And just be willing to go. Just the fact that we're surrendered is enough. God has told us, no, you're right where I want you. But it's amazing how much you grow spiritually when you're willing to go even if he doesn't want you to go. 
That's the bottom line. We all need to be totally surrendered. Amen? Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I don't know what the Lord's speaking to your heart about through this message. But just be open to what the Holy Spirit has to say to you. That's always the bottom line. Whatever he wants you to do. If he wants you to go, you need to go. If he doesn't want you to go, you can stay here and pray. And as you stay here and pray, you can also give so that others can go. One of the hardest things for me is to say no to missionaries. There are so, so many good missionaries who need to be on the field, who deserve to be on the field, and who will do a great job on the field. And we just don't have enough resources to support every one of them who wants to come here and be supported. Uh, this was my job before I became senior pastor. When I became associate pastor in 1991 or two, uh, my job was to handle the missionaries. My job was to talk to them on the phone and read their resumes and give them applications and, and tell them, well, yeah, we'd like you to come here and present your work, or no, we, we just can't. It was hard to say no, always has been, because the resources just haven't been here. Maybe, maybe you are where the resources come from. We still want to take on a Jewish missionary. That's what we're hoping with Ephraim Goldstein. We still want to take on a Jewish missionary. Will you be willing to give those resources so that others can go to help us fulfill our obligation to reach the world? Father, whatever your will is for our lives, may we fulfill it. May we respond to your Holy Spirit these next few minutes and glorify you through our responses, for we ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. With thanksgiving, amen. Whatever the need, you come. Go ahead and please be seated for just a moment. If there's anything that we can help you with throughout the week, uh, just call the office and uh, uh, see if we're here. And uh, we'll, we'll be glad to talk with you and help you with anything that we can. Uh, before we dismiss, just a couple of announcements. Uh, this is the second Sunday of the month. We, we uh, postponed a couple of things last week because Dr. Bob Valier was with us last Sunday night. But we will have communion tonight at the end of the evening service. We will also have trustee meeting at 515 and deacons at 535. De trustees 515, deacons at 535. So we're going to consider this the first Sunday of the month for that purposes. We'll also have 2010 tonight. Uh, we shorten it up a little bit on nights when we have communion. So 2010 is what we'll have tonight, or maybe 15, 15, 15, something like that. Uh, be a little bit shorter tonight. And Clay, you have an announcement you wanted to make? Okay. If you do that, and then close us in prayer, if you would. Good morning, everybody. Just wanted to give everybody a heads up. The guys especially have had a couple conversations the last couple weeks with guys about our men's Bible study on Tuesday night. We have finally moved to the men's room again. So we'll be sitting down having, a, for lack of a better term, a real proper men's Bible study starting at 6.30 on Tuesdays. So please come. We're still, going to, we're still going to be putting them online. We're just able to do it with a laptop and everything. So we'll start at 6.30. A little bit of time of fellowship, prayer, and then we'll do the uh, service. And we should be out about 8 o'clock. It's going to last about an hour and a half. So the guys who were talking to me had questions. Please come. Anybody else who's never been, please come and join us. And um, we'll, we discuss things that, of course, are concern us as men. The ladies have their time, and the men, we need our time as well. So please come if you can. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this day that you have given us. Thank you for the sunshine that we have enjoyed. Lord, thank you for another day of blessings that you have bestowed upon us as well. Lord, we thank you and we love you for your grace, your mercy, 
your sovereignty, the fact that you have control over our lives, that you have given us your son Jesus as a savior so that we may have eternal life. And Lord, help us to take in the message this morning that we are to spread the gospel. We are to help spread the gospel. And as our commandment from you, and we can do our part, even if we do not want to go out, we can still do our part here in Columbus, Ohio, just just by speaking a kind word or doing something just of a generous nature or whatever it may be, maybe just be serving somebody and whatever they need served in, whether it be a repair, whether it simply need a ride somewhere, whether it need to be groceries or medication picked up, Lord, whatever it may be, just help us to have the courage to stand out and to do the work that you have commanded us. Lord, we lift up Miss Lillian and the family. Um, continue to watch over them and comfort them. Be with them, Lord, as they go through her loss. But Lord, we are so amazed and we are so just grateful, grateful that you have prepared a place and that she is now in heaven with you. She is in a new body. She has no more hurts. She has, and she's home with you, and she's home with others who have gone before her. And we are thankful, Lord, that you have provided that place. Thank you so much for that, Lord. Thank you for your son, Jesus, once again. We ask that everybody be safe on their way home, to watch over them, comfort them, and bring us back at the next appointed hour. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet.